Radio Show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We stand together and accept that we now live in a world transformed by Fukushima. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on UCY.TV Radio. We relentlessly engage every ear that listens. We expose and confront the complete lack of accountability for the nuclear industry. Consider social engineering programs who view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. The Age of Vision Radio Show creates a venue that all will choose. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action and save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Our actions matter. Every voice matters. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good morning, UCY.TV radio listeners. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. Uh, Today is August 17, 2016. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Today we have Mimi German with No Nukes Northwest and Radcast.org on the line with us today. Uh, Today is our day when we interview activists and people who are making a difference. And true to form... Mimi is out in her garden picking beans while we talk because she feeds her community. So welcome to the show, Mimi. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me back. It's really fun to reconnect with you and your listeners from my little farm. Yeah, it's really nice. How big is your little farm? Like You live in Portland, don't you? I live in Portland, and we took all the grass out. Um, So we have... The best way for me to describe it is we have about 27 or 25 rows. No, it's more like 19 or 20 rows. And each row is about uh, between 25 and 30 feet. So it's a little mini farm. It's a small little farm. And the rows aren't, like, uniform. They're all different ways. They curve. In in your backyard. In your backyard. It's in your backyard. Yeah, it surrounds the house. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. And... So I, uh, we pick food, we eat for ourselves, and we do food drop-offs, um, not all over the place, primarily at one park. Um, and then if I know that other people are in need, I'll go there. But Portland's really cool because we have, um, we're pretty well set up on feeding people here. Um, we have food banks. We also have uh, just a lot of different people, like myself, out there bringing food to the people. Yeah, so well, I think I that's common a little, in Oregon. Yeah, it's a great thing, and it should be common everywhere, and it's really sad that it's not. And what we do with our food, we don't believe that we should be paying for food. I just feel that good food, healthy food should be free. Um, so we grow extra food, a lot of it, and we give it away. And people are like, wow, it's free, and we can't, it's free. It's supposed to be free. That's, it's that's a different a, concept. And people are it's, shocked it's that you want to give them food. It's the same thing with my garden. I, I have, you know, this is, this. we were talking about this before we went on the air, that how in Oregon, I, I am from Los Angeles, essentially. And I, I, my only other city I lived in really was the French Quarter in New Orleans. So I really have been in a city most of my life, right? So when I came to Oregon, it was really kind of a... a very different culture here, but at least in Eugene, you everybody has a garden. Like every person has, um, even if you have live in an apartment, you have little pots out on your garden. Everybody here grows food, and that's what we do. Is you, one person, unless you have a family, a big family, you always have too much food. So that's you do exactly need to right. give it away. Like you have yeah. to give it away. Like I have. 
greens in my backyard and celery that's growing practically year round and tomatoes that pop up. I don't even plant them and the tomatoes now just pop up by themselves. <laughs> then that's you right. just you yeah. have to give them away. And it, it is actually but here at least in Eugene here and probably in Portland, like there's food banks. There like there's food for Lane County here where I go give them all my vegetables. I you know, put them in and drop them off and they'll take them. So you're saying you go to a park and give people free food? Yeah, there's a park that I was introduced to. Um, it's called Dawson Park, and I was introduced to Dawson Park by one of our revolutionary leaders here uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement. Her name's Teresa Rayford, and she started a, a movement here called Don't Shoot Portland. And um, it was after Michael Brown got killed and by the cops. And we all met at Dawson Park and had gatherings. We learned our rights. We had lawyers come in and talk with us about know your rights and how to fight back and how to survive if possible. And I got to know this community really well. So I just continued to go there and support the people who hang out in that community at the park. And I just show up with big buckets of food. Wow. <laughs> and it, it's gone in about five minutes as soon as I get there. Everybody is excited about it. And I get, you know, marriage proposals in the process, which is just fun. <laughs> well, that's good. They probably want you to cook for them, too. <laughs> Give them free they food do. They do. They do. I've got <laughs> well, that's the I interesting think. thing. But, that's a, that, you know, that's such a beautiful thing. And this is one of the things that, you know, here, you know, we are working ourselves actively engaging to do all we can to close the Columbia Generating Station here in the Northwest and to make people aware that radiation, you can't see it, can't feel it, can't taste it, can't smell it. It's there. We're all Fukushima people. I mean, you know, I was telling you here in Eugene, I've had somebody, people look at me like, oh, you're the Fukushima lady, aren't you? And I'm like, the last time somebody said that to me, I used to kind of smile and say, yeah, you know, I want to tell people about it. And, and the last time I just snapped and I said, we're all Fukushima people, dumbass. <laughs> I was like just mad about it because really people don't get it. They can pretend that it is not happening, but frankly, Fukushima is far worse than it used to be six, almost six years ago now. And well, we can what, pretend as much as we want. What I know in Portland, particularly to, specifically to Portland, is that our radiation, our background radiation level, has gone up since 311, since Fukushima happened, has gone up 161%. Oh, my That's gosh. That's background. Yep. What do you so, mean background? Yeah, what do you mean by that? Can you, could you explain that for background, the listeners? Did you say background? Yeah, Background is ambient reading, so this isn't your dose rate. This is just what's in the air around you, and mm -hmm. you can't escape it. So it's not something that, well, to not make it too complicated, it's just everywhere, and it's called background. It's also called noise. Um, there's different names for it, but we usually refer to it as background or ambient radiation. And um, so dose rates are different. Um, again, I'm not talking about dose rates. I don't know what the level of dose rate difference is exactly, and I should really find that out. But what I know from doing uh, Geiger counter testing since right after 311 happened to now is we are now a steady 160% higher than we were wow. Wow. almost six years ago. Mm -hmm. So that, wow. what that does mean is that the cancer rates are rising, and they are rising, and they'll continue to rise because we're just at the beginning, we're just at the tip of That's those right. cancers presenting themselves. That's right. Cancers present themselves in certain order. Children get cancers first. Women get cancers next. Um, and, and young men, the young, bone yeah. younger the, people. The bone cancer, right, the bone cancers take longer to present themselves. The leukemias will start to show up. The thyroid cancers are come early. Um, so we're just starting to see all this. Oh, also heart, the rate of uh, heart disease and heart attacks and quick deaths from heart failure. That's going to be on the increase, too. And sterility. Yeah. I mean, what, well, yeah. You know, because mm -hmm. really what we're going to see is this generation of kids who were 7, 8, 9, 10 years old, and they're heading into, in 10 years from, you know, 2011, like in five or six years, that's 
we're going to really start seeing that. And what's interesting is, you know, they're sort of, I really believe that this whole Zika virus scare is a cover-up for the radiation uh, from all, all the uranium mining that's going on in the south and the increase in radiation exposure. Like, even in Key Biscayne, there's a leaking nuclear power plant where those pe- women it have sure had is. microencephaly. So, and I, yeah. I, you know, they're just out are you there. Talking sp- about tur- are you talking about Turkey Point? Yes. You know, yeah. they're, it's mm-hmm. outrageous, and yet that's where they yep. show the women that had the microencephaly. I mean, I, I, you know, anybody can do well, this. Well, well, the other part, just dealing with microencephaly, the highest rate of microencephaly is in Yakima, which is in Washington State, which is on right. the river of the Columbia, which that's is, right. you know, just miles from Hanford and all of that's the waste right. that came in from Hanford, plus the releases from CGS, from the Columbia Generating Station. So, and, and they, the... Department of Health in Washington, when they started to see this incredible amount of microencephaly in Yakima County, um, they didn't look into radioactive uh, cause at all. And I know that because I spoke to the woman who was in charge of the study, and I asked her why. And she said, why would this be from Hanford or the Columbia? She didn't even know that the Columbia Generating Station existed. She, wow. Everybody knows Hanford. And I said, you don't know that we have a, a working new plant? You run this department at the Department of Health. She got she didn't get fired. She got moved. But like you know, and this is this is what we're all up against. We're up against morons. Absolutely the most moronic, lying, deceitful um, killers who run yeah. our government and kill us all. And and so I just love being in my garden and giving food away. I mean, it kind of keeps coming back to that because the reality of what our governments are doing to us is so heinous that it's really hard to get your head around it. it that's why, in fact, people don't want to talk about it, because then they have to wrap their brains around the fact that somebody in our government is intentionally misleading all of our politicians, forcing the scientists to underplay. I mean, this, I mean, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I, I've said this a few times. This is the options that people that are in the positions to tell us are in. They either get to keep their trap shut, mislead us about the facts, and watch everybody die, and have Mm -hmm. a really great paying job, and hope that they have the Mm -hmm. best health care to take care of their own families, because they know they're going to get it too. Or they stand up for integrity, start telling people about it, and watch people die and lose their jobs and have to go do something else that they can't possibly imagine. So, I mean, it's this dichotomy. This is why we need conscientious objectors. This is why I'm saying this repeatedly. We need conscientious objectors to say, it doesn't matter how much money you provide me, how much security you're supposedly giving me. We're not participating in lying to the general public because we need to face this and find solutions because as long as we continue to deny it like the microencephaly we are we're not going to find a way to protect yakima county from microencephaly as long as we refuse to admit that it's caused by nuclear radiation which the government pretty quickly did that's right their reasoning for the yakima cases and this is direct this is direct from my ears to the mouth of this woman who ran the, the the um testing or whatever it was the um, research on why the microencephaly was happening in Yakima. And she said to me, they are getting microencephaly because, well, the babies are, because they're poor. That's right. Let's blame the poor people. I said, That's I said right. do you, do you, I said, are you going to, are you going to stick by that? Because I said, I'm going to repeat that. And she said, they don't get folic acid. They, and I said, how do you know they don't get folic acid? Because for those who don't know, um, pregnant women need folic acid in order to have healthy babies. It's it's a necessity. And if you don't eat necessarily all of your all your vegetables, kids, um, you don't have enough folic acid. So you just get a vitamin. It's, it's you know it's a supplement. So she said that it wasn't in the medical reports that they took folic acid. I said, was it in the medical reports that they did not take folic acid? She said, no. I said, so you're guessing that they didn't have folic acid and that's how you're making your presentation that it's folic acid? And she said, well, if they were taking it, it would have been in the report. 
Well, I'm like, wow. Did you say to her uh, that it, was, it has been proven that nuclear radiation causes microencephaly? John Goffman... No, when I told her... Yeah, no, I was talking specifically on her lack of research, you know, and yeah. her presumption that we're based in a, la- a complete misrepresentation of what she was seeing. And that's what they put it. That's what they put out. That's what the papers presented. That these people got microencephaly, well, the children, because they did not have folic acid because they were poor. Wow. That was the answer. That was the answer that went out. Wow. Well, let's blame the victims once again. Let's make sure that the victims are yep. the reason. Yep. I mean, it's yep. the same thing what they're doing with the Zika virus. You know, they're out there spraying. I mean, this contaminant that they're spraying, God knows what it's going to do to the babies exactly. in utero. I mean, the exactly. children in utero. And then they can blame the contaminant and not blame the real root cause. And, and the reason, I mean, let's be really clear. This is why. This, we, we started the show talking about why people don't want to talk about it because then they have to change what they do. It's exactly the same thing with these government agencies. If they admit the facts that these, this, A, nuclear is a failed experiment that is poisoning the entire it sure planet. Is. It yep. is a 100% failed experiment. That 100%. The only reason. The only reason that we have it is so that the United States can have war, have weapons, right. and give us right. the con- controlling power over... And that's why China wants these nuclear power plants. I think I read China's putting in 20 nuclear power plants. That's their plan over the next decade. So it's not about it's not about energy. It's not about any of that. It's about war, 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 and murder. I mean, literally, it is... I honestly, uh, Mimi, I th- obviously, I'm on the radio three times a week. I have no idea how people can just ignore this. I, I know it's a futile exercise calling our elected officials, but I still do call them and poke it's them in actually, the eye. It's actually not necessarily, you know, something that does not work. We've had, I've experienced um, watching pressure on certain politicians work. It doesn't work all the time, but... It, do, it can work. I think that's the thing. It's not about it does work, but it can work. And we never know when, when we're going to hit the tipping point when it does work, you know. So I, I encourage it. I, they do not like, they, they don't know anything. But if they get bombarded with phone calls, they know a lot. And um, they tend to heed the call if people take the time to make them. So I do encourage it. I think that it's, it's a good thing to do. Well, you know, uh, there's this whole thing that talks about government influencing how uh, taxpayers' interest in uh, what the government does has zero impact on it. But I think that's because very few people actually contact the government. I mean, Mm -hmm. we have very... And to be honest, this election is pretty much making me believe that our vote doesn't matter, that it does not matter one iota what we want or where we go. And I'm Really close to. I, I, mean, I agree. I, I, I personally am one of these Dem exit. I've been a Democrat all my life, and I, I am stunned to realize that we live in a country with one fascist party called the Republicrats. Like one, they're all exactly alike. It doesn't really mm-hmm. matter. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, I'm voting. For, I decided this. I, it's kind of a protest vote. I'm voting for Jill Stein just to poke him in the eye, because. They've set the bar for Jill Stein to be at the presidential debates. You have to get 15% of the vote to be in the next presidential debates. Well, you know what? When Jill Stein gets 15%, they're going to raise the rules to, like, you have to get 20%. or Whatever it is, it's so obvious the fascism is just, it is blatant fascism. I mean, we literally have, I saw a story this morning that showed that Trump is being accused of raping a child. So we literally have a rapist and a murderer running for our presidential candidates. Those are our two top contenders. America is going to get complacency. This is my thing. I tell this to people all the time. Complacency is consent. So your refusal to get involved and get engaged and demand we find solutions. To to me, nuclear pollution is at the core and at the heart of the destruction of our culture. I don't see how people can ignore that. We have this whole Zika virus. They want us to spend billions of dollars. What did you say? I said, I think that's a great statement, what you just said. It you is know, actually. About it being the core. Mm-hmm. 
It is, because when we think about what happened in our country or around the world after World War II, once they learned to split the atom, the mm -hmm. mad scientists went mad. That essentially. Yeah. I knew exactly what you meant when you said that. That's Yeah, that was profound. Mm -hmm. And we have been living with it. You know, I, I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 55, so I've been living with nuclear all my life. And I, I personally think that John Kennedy got murdered because he was going to end the nuclear program. I mean, there's a lot of things that it has done and really harmed in every way. Like we started the show talking about the microencephaly babies. But what we also don't talk about is the autism rates. We don't. T autism is another cause of nuclear pollution. I mean, there is dis the disabilities are subtle in very many ways when people get disability. Like I have cousins that live in Louisiana that have... Um, children that are have severe disabilities that live, needed to live in nursing homes. At a high rate, I have quite a few cousins who have children who need assistance. Well, they live in toxic zones, and people want to just pretend like it's, it's not affecting their families. Uh, or that it's normal for this kind of, you know, these kinds of things to happen. Yes. Well, one of the things Including I did want to talk to you I wanted to talk to you this weekend. I stopped down on the way back down from Washington. We, I stopped with Theo, who's an anti-nuke activist. He's got a YouTube channel called Hippie with a Gun, which cracks me up because he doesn't, ha he doesn't really have a gun. I mean, I think he owns a gun, but the way you'd think he'd be carrying around since Oregon, you can openly carry in Oregon, but he doesn't. But we went down to... Uh, Trojan Is that because, right? We can we, we we can openly carry in Oregon. That's how much I know about guns. Yes, Is that right? Can, yes. Wow. Yes. Oregon's an I open carry. That. Yeah, there was a huge story up in Portland. Some black guys tried to open carry, and they got attacked by the police. <laughs> oh right, right. No, no, no. I know that I was at the um, the a protest recently where it was a Don't Shoot Portland protest, and this guy who is a known, um, just basically, he's just a pain in the ass, um, like, I don't know, I hate liberals, something like that, he pulled the gun out uh, because he feared the people around him, though he came to the rally. And I remember that now, and, and about open carry. I just don't think about um, that Oregon is an open carry state because that's so insane to me, and I have a hard time leaving things that are that insane in my brain. Well, Thanks there's a lot of people who really believe that... <laughs> there's many people who believe that open carry makes us all more secure. I have clients... I have a client who actually is a gun manufacturer, and we've had this conversation many times. He believes that open carry would eliminate the need for police. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Well... Yeah. That's a second issue. I did want to talk right, to you about the right. Trojan Park. In Oregon, mm -hmm. uh, when I moved to Oregon, one of the things I heard was that Oregon's nuclear-free. We only had these small nuclear things at the University of Oregon. And that Oregon, the activists in Oregon were so active that they got the Trojan nuclear power plant at the mouth of the Columbia River shut down. And so I... We decided we were going to go look at it. Me and Theo, we, we uh, he, I was driving down. He lives in Portland. I said, well, let's meet up there and let's take pictures and see what it looks like 20, 30 years later. Because I think it was closed down in 82 or 86, something like that. So we get there and it's called a park. I was like, say what? It was. It's not a closed nuclear power plant. It, they've turned it into a park and said that they have remediated the soil there. And honestly, if I had not been covering St. Louis, I would not have recognized the nuclear power plant. But from where we were at the park side, because you arrive and there's like a little pond in front of this other building where you have to drive down the dirt road to get to it. And then the other side is the river. So, but they built these little man-made ponds in back of it, I guess, to put the water, right? But it, it was really stunning to recognize that what the, EP, what the government did literally with the Trojan nuclear power plant was cover it up with dirt and make these mounds that look just like the Westlake landfill. I am not kidding you. It was so stunning. I'm like, if I had not seen that, I would, if I had not been covering St. Louis, I would not have recognized it. But it was like, oh, my God, that's, that's their idea. Just cover it up with dirt and move along. Make a park out of it. Stunning. Right. 
Mm-hmm. So we ran into yeah. a local who told us that there is no nuclear fuel there. So is that a correct statement that there's no nuclear fuel there? No. <laughs> no. no, it's not. They they have all of the waste that was, um, you know, even hotter at the time. It was being used at the time. Um, all of that waste is stored there, and wow. there's nowhere to take it. They, they'd like to move it. They'd like to take it somewhere, but there's nowhere to take it because we don't have a national safe repository for nuclear waste. We just keep making more of it and putting it where it is, like at whatever nuke plant it's coming from. That's where it lives because, except for the stuff that's at, you know, a couple different places, like the stuff that got sent to Hanford before. Uh, Hanford doesn't receive that stuff anymore. So there's nowhere to send nuclear waste, but we keep making more waste 24-7 as we have our nuclear plants online. So no, that waste is still there. So it just sits there. Well, we actually were walking around, and it's, you know, in Oregon, we it grows blackberries everywhere. If you're walking down any road, you're going to see blackberries wildly growing, which is what was growing around all of these man-made ponds. We were walking around the path to the thing. We ran into a gentleman who kind of gave us a short uh, pro-nuke synopsis of the entire plant. But while we were taking pictures, we actually saw a mutated. It, and I would suggest that everybody start doing this, look at your plants a little bit closer. Start looking at your berry plants and, and any any type of plants that you have in your garden for mutations because then you'll see exactly because the plants are beginning to show signs. It takes a good long while. That's what I thought I would look. It's been out there for about 20 years. So you I know, thought... For people, who wanna, for, for people who want to know more about that particular thing, about mutations, you can go to Timothy Mousseau uh, Dr. Timothy Mousseau, it's uh, M-O-U-S-S-E-A-U. He's a professor in, I think, Virginia. He has a website, and he is the leading scientist on mutations from in animals and plant life from Chernobyl and Fukushima. So you can actually see pictures of what things look like so that you can start to understand what you might be seeing. Yeah. How do we spell his name? It's uh, Timothy. His last name is M. O M as in Mary, O U S S E A U. Okay. He is the leading researcher on mutations from nuclear disaster. Wow. Wow. He, he, he He's also actually, easy to access. He's very okay. accessible. Well, maybe I'll have to reach out to him and ask him to join us on the show. That might be a good, great, great idea. Yep. Because I just, you know, he's the person, is he the one that did the uh, report we read last year that there was like one bird or a few birds in Fukushima, like the bird, that census on birds is dwindling. Is he that same person that did that whole series? He is. He's the one who started all of all of the information on all of this. It, it, it all began wow. with butterflies, and he saw the mutations first with butterflies out of Chernobyl, wow. and he just kept going. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's one of our heroes, and people, yeah. people who diss, people who like to diss people who get paid to do research like this, and they just think that anybody who's paid to do research like this is a fraud, that's not true. Timothy Mousseau is a hero. He goes in to the most, I, I've talked to him about this, like I said, Dr. So you go in to the most radiated places on Earth to do right. research. He goes, yeah. He says, like, somebody has to. Wow. So, wow. so, if, so do not diss this man, whoever. And he's looking, also you know? fighting against the system. I just Googled him, and he works at the University of South, South Carolina. He's a professor mm-hmm. in the Department of Biology, which, frankly, working at any big university, he probably has a very narrow line to cross with his studies and his information, because most universities don't encourage people to tell the truth about nuclear pollution. It's kind of surprising right. that he, they, they, this university supports that kind of work, would allow him to continue mm-hmm. to work there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is how deep the corruption is. You know, and th- this is what I mean. Like when when I say that we, the nuclear pollution really affects every single aspect of our lives. We cannot, we can't. Like I plan on going camping in the next two days with my kids. And by the way, folks, we're going to have a repeat on Friday. We're going to do. A, a, I'm going to repeat an interview I did with Don Chapman so I can get away. But. Um, it's stunning for me to think I'm going to be going camping up in the Cascadia Mountains of Oregon and. 
the likelihood of me finding some type of mutation on a plant is, I think, probably pretty great. You know, if you know what you're looking for, like what you look for is leaves that grow out of leaves. You know what I mean? Like that's what we found on the blackberry bushes, the little leaves that were popping mm -hmm. out of leaves. They weren't growing mm -hmm. fruit. They were growing more leaves. They were twisting in circles like the head of the flower would be, but it wasn't a flower. It was a leaf. Right. So, and it looks normal because your eyes, we walk past it, and unless you look for it, you're not going to see it. And it's, it's kind of like the elephant in the room. Like, this is accumulating on a daily basis, and people are just, not, by the time people actually become aware of it, uh, it I mean, the, frankly, there's not much we can do about it. Until, this is why I'm sort of adamant about this. I think if we can get, like, Dr. Mousseau, actually has the capacity he's doing the scientific studies that's showing us how it's affecting us what we need is the other other there his counterparts in the nuclear division to say okay so how can we maybe reverse the splitting of the atom or stop the fission or i don't know who the heck knows i don't understand that stuff but there has to be the, something the answer, that we can do the answer is um the very first answer is to shut down all nukes today Immediately. It, when nukes are online, um, the dangers of meltdown are imminent from anything, from an earthquake to an ice storm to drought to heated waters from a river. To, to floods. Look what's happening in the floods. Right, the, right, the whole thing. So that's the first step. And then um, getting that waste out of those, um, out, of the, out of the pools you know, and getting them into a safer space, which we don't even have yet. I mean, this is why the whole conversation gets so, like, tripped out, because we talk about shutting them down and getting the waste out of the pools and putting them somewhere, and there's no somewhere. There is no somewhere. But but regardless of that, we still have to shut down the new plants and get the waste out and put them... That's in. right. We have to stop making more of it. You know, Every back, nuclear Back to the Don and Gilmore episode that you had. You know, back to everything Don and Gilmore talked with you about. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Well, it is astounding how much waste is... I mean, we, we have just slightly under 100 nuclear power plants that are producing 1,000 Chernobyls, what you say, every year. Mm hmm So... Do, I mean, just do the numbers with the waste that we have. I mean, and that doesn't even count what we're doing to the First Nations, dumping all the uranium mine trailings there. So the offense of this industry to all life on our planet is uh, inexcusable. And people's complacency to shutting it down, I mean... Mimi, what do you think will it take? Will it take people in the streets? Is it going to take, what's, what do you think will it take for the government to really, the Department of Energy to own up to the fact that this is a failed experiment? We're hearing more and more that, you know, Hillary Clinton is super pro-nuke. She will not close down a single nuke plant. In fact, she wants to build more nuke plants. She believes in nuclear. That's your, that's your answer, Lonnie. The government politicians are totally insane. You know, it's just an insane thing that's happening on our planet right now, and people won't stop it. So it comes back to the discussions that Guy McPherson has with people about near-term human extinction, and what do you want to do now? You know, well, I also want to help shut down new plants. You do. I think that's not noble. It's sane, you know. Right. So we exactly. work to do that, and... You know, we grow our food and we give it away and we take care of each other because sooner than later, we're not going to be able to because as we see today at Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant in Massachusetts, the waters, the cooling waters in the water are too, uh, from, the, from the water source, is too warm to cool the fuel rods at Pilgrim. So what that does is it creates a slowdown in the system which hurts the system. And it becomes dangerous yet again for the nuclear power plant's existence, which means, you know, it can cause a meltdown. So this is water getting warmer, the sources. So it can't, it can't cool the fuel rods correctly. It changes the entire system of um, volume and the way the water is moved through the nuclear power plant. And everything starts to shut down. This is happening everywhere. Last year on the Columbia River, which 
is the source of water for the Columbia Generating Station that you and I are usually talking about, the waters were so warm that it killed 250,000 sockeye salmon before they were able to get back for spawning. This is the same water that needs to cool a nuclear fuel, a a nuclear power plant. So we don't, it's, this isn't going to be solved. This is just going to end. Well, not terribly. in our lifetimes. I mean, at, at least it's not. You're so much more positive than, than I am, Bonnie. I mean, you know. I, I, oh, this I is the thing. That, I remember this. You know, you don't know what you don't know until you know you don't right. know it. So, really, yeah. we don't know the answer. Right now, it seems like an impossible impossibility, but 200 years ago, flying in the air was an impossibility. And we take it for granted now. Talking on this cell phone and on this Skype through the Internet, all of this, nobody could have even imagined it 100 years ago. I mean, I grew up in 1955. I was a little kid in 1960. My first job, I worked at a bank, and I remember being shocked when my boss told me, one day we're going to have cards. We're going to have little plastic cards like a credit card to use for money instead of us giving out cash. We were shocked. Now, that was like in there late 70s right and look where we've come we, we just take it for granted so I am an eternal optimist on this but I know this as a fact uh, uh, from being a child abuse survivor you cannot solve a catastrophic problem by ignoring it the only time you start to face these really um, uh, horrible events in life uh, is by looking at it facing it and deciding, okay, what's it going to take because we have a big mountain. I mean, that's from the perspective of a little kid who grew up in a house that felt like a prison. There was no end for me. I felt like when I was seven years old, I was suicidal. So, you know, it's to me, I relate this to the same thing. Like, it, it looked like I could not become a decent human being and a decent adult, that my life had just been trashed before I was even born. I refuse to give up, and I refuse to participate in the complacency of, oh, well, that's the way it is. That's how it's always going to be. No, 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 and no. We, all mm-hmm. of us, are here on purpose. We're, our spirits, our life, we interact with the universe. We're not an accident. Our energetic level, our love. I really believe that love is the greatest power on this earth. We can move literally mountains. We hear about stories all the time. So this is why I, I, I love the idea of you growing food because when we share and give, it increases our capacity to love. Uh, love is an it's exercise. Just, it's a verb, it's not, you know. It's not just about growing food. It's about giving it away for free and keeping right. your enslaved notions about capitalism. Uh, just removing all of that from the process and saying, right. "I that have, you have food. To buy you food. need food. I'm going to give you food." You know. Right. That's yeah. Right. And that's exactly right. That's what it's about. You need food, and I'm going to give you food, and we're going to help, and it changes the paradigm. And and this is really the thing about it's. A, people say, well, it's a, it's about being generous. It's not about being. It's not generosity. Nice. It's humanity. Yeah. It's yeah, like exactly. we live on a planet where we all have certain inalienable rights. One of them is clean water and clean food, all of, all of which, both of which have been taken away by the industrial, what I consider the industrial military complex. They industrialized our food supply. They've industrialized our medical industry. They've industrialized every aspect of our lives to where, you know, we're being forced to buy health insurance that really is health care for profit. I mean... The twisted mentality of the people that are running our government and the way they talk circles around themselves to convince themselves that they're doing the right thing, it's obvious that they're causing catastrophic issues for the entire planet. But it is like my psychotic father who like, couldn't see beyond himself, who kept telling himself he was a great dad. You know what I mean? Like, th- we, right. we really have to have a come-to-Jesus moment with all of ourselves and just say, you know what, this is where we're at. This is what we have to do. And we must force the Department of Energy, which is where it all I think it all generates from in the West, to just just stop. I mean, just, just stop with, like, the EPA just continuing to lie, 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 and lie. I, it, I, 
I don't know what it will take, but if there was millions of us out there clamoring, they would listen. They would shake in their boots, frankly. So, I don't know. I don't know. So, uh, Mimi, could you share with us a little bit more about what you've been up to in terms of uh, other activism? Because I know that you're an activist up in Portland, and you do other things other than uh, your movement to close down the Columbia Generating Station. Well, yeah, I can, um, and I will, but I wanted to go back to Trojan for another minute because I wanted, okay. you know, we're talking about people and what people can do. Well, there's another aspect that I look at with people, and I've, I've said this on your show. I think that there are so many people who have just, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know why, but they were not nourished correctly, and they're just bad, you know, they're truly bad. And this is an example. I was asked to come, this was like two years ago, I was asked to come speak about um, how the government is lying to us about radiation to like, I don't know, kind of like an Elks Club sort of thing. And so I went, and there was a guy there who led the meeting, and he was a manager at Trojan before Trojan closed for years. And he said to me, um, do you want to have a tour of Trojan that he could get me in to do a tour? And I said, I really want to see the new casks, the waste casks. And he said, okay. And he has a friend who is a security guard there. Unfortunately, the day that we went, his friend wasn't working. It was a different security guard who wouldn't let us through so I could go see that, you know, um, which was a bummer. However, I had my um, Geiger counter with me. And I kept asking this guy questions, like, where, because I saw a vent, like a, sort of like a sewer vent or some kind of, it looked like an air vent in the ground next to the plant. And it made me think, what happened to all of the equipment that blew the air through this? So I asked him, and he said, you don't want to know. And I said, why? And he said, you just don't. And I said, well, w wow. what was that connected to? And we, he took me on a whole, you know, I, I know about new plants, at least enough to have a, a decent conversation with a, an engineer about them. And he took me on a journey through the new plant and the, um, the filtration system and the air system and, you know, all kinds of things. And we got back to the day that, that Oregon decided, I don't know who made the decision, somebody made the decision that the tower, that the, the whole plant was going to need to be, like, blown up and taken down so nobody would see it anymore. And I said, what did you guys do with the materials right. that were so radioactive? And he said, some of it went to Hanford. And I said, okay, I figured as much. What about the other some of it? Where did that go? And he said, if I tell you, I will never cop to telling you. I will never say wow. that it was me. I will say that you are making this up. He said, but what we did with a lot of the tower, the cooling tower, was um, we took the metals and threw them into the river. What? I said, you did what? He said, we threw them into the river. And I said, oh, my God. And I said, and you did that because? He said, why do you think we did it? I said, because you were furious that you all lost your jobs. He said, we hated anti-nuclear activists. And we hated that we had to do this and take down all of this. And we hated that we were losing our jobs. So we said, get and tossed so much of the metal into the river that were highly radioactive. I said, do you have any idea how that raised the temperature in the river? He said, yes. And I said, how much did that raise the temperature in the river? He said, by two degrees. He said, oh that will God. never go down. Mm -hmm. He said, if you went out with, you know, I don't know, kind of, I don't know how deep the river is. I don't think it's all that deep right there. If people went out with uh, detectors of some kind, to locate metals at the bottom of the river. He said, you'll see them there. Wow. So this, these are the people. These are people who did this. 
And so my... I'm going to have lied about, about it. That we, that he li- literally, <laughs> they lied to the locals about what they've done. The man that we ran into there, who was a local, he lived there since 1982, assured me that there was no longer any nuclear... Enough, the only real harm was in those pools of water because the thing was designed to circle the water back into itself so that none of the river would be contaminated. That's what he told me. Wow. Yeah. So they just threw big pieces of the nuke plant into the river and it's still down yeah. there. I mean, mid, yeah. no doubt that's yeah. part why we have the, the at the mouth of the Columbia River is one of the largest dead zones on the planet. No doubt. Yeah. He said if people went to look for this, they would find it. Oh, my gosh. So wouldn't that, it's still radioactive 20 years later, right? I mean, if we were to like. It's radioactive for 250,000 years later, you know. So, but it's sitting at the bottom of the the river, river. warming up the entire Mm -hmm. river in and out. It's right at the mouth of the Columbia River. Yes. Yeah, I mean, like, it's hard for me to even repeat the story because it was just, and he was serious. I mean, So he, that is, that is uh, portions of a nuclear power plant are buried at the, this is why the Columbia River, all up and down the Columbia River, it's not just from Hanford, it's from Trojan. It's part of the, and it's part of the ventilation system. That's where, when, when we talk about CGS leaking and we talk about the radiation going into the air, it goes out of the vents. So it's the vent system. It's the, the pipes for the vent system that had all that radiation going through it. That's what is in the river. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is really, really stunning. Like, that's just shocking. And... They know, but this the Department of Energy must know this. They couldn't not know that. Don't they keep track of all their inventory? I don't think they keep track of anything. And, yes, I agree that they probably do know. Um, I think they know a hell of a lot more than they ever will let on to. Well, we know that. Um, if they know about this, I don't know. I think that I don't, I don't really know how you hide it. Um, you know, the biggest tragedy is that they were allowed to blow up any visual that there was a nuke plant there in the first place. If they weren't allowed to blow it up um, and make it seem like nothing ever was there, they wouldn't be able to have had a park there. That park wouldn't exist if they left the structure standing, the dome. This was the other thing that shocked me about that place. It's run by General Electric. If you click on the website, like when I went to the website, it's a it directs you to the General Electric website. I mean, I actually had to go out of it a couple times. I thought I was making a mistake. So this is this is the shock. The, 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 this is treated as if it's a regular national park, but it's not. It's actually a nuke dump site. I, I, what you just told me has me completely dumbfounded. I'm like, I'm beside myself. That's why I didn't tell you yesterday. I wanted to save it for you for the show. <laughs> thanks, thanks. I, I mean, yeah. it's... They think that they, did they really, I mean, they knew what they were, did they not believe that nuclear is harmful? Do they not believe that? They believed that, that they believed that what they had was one of the safest nuclear power plants in America, and they were being made to take it down. And so going from, let's say it was, okay, um, let's just say it was, and then all of a sudden it's gone, and these people are pissed off, what do they do? They dump radioactive materials into the river. So no longer can they at least walk away thinking that, you know, well, at least we didn't do any harm, if that's what they thought. They cannot think that anymore. They know exactly what they did. Well, to be clear, I was told by this local that part of the reason it was closed down was because they it had so many problems. It wasn't just the anti-nukers. It was really more... The guy basically said it was less about the anti-nukers and more about the constant problems of getting the thing up and running. It was never effectively running. It always ran into problems. Yeah, it was the money stuff. 
Yeah, and so he said, well, between that and the sentiments of the anti-Nukers, they said, okay, well, we'll just give in. And it and they, it allowed the anti-Nukers to believe they had a big win when, in fact, it was more about the problems of the, of the design and the generating plant. Uh, and part of the guy said part of that problem that he thought this is why I think he must have worked for the nuclear industry because he knew a lot about it and he said part of the reason why that it didn't work was because it wasn't set up to be an, a, a big gigantic working functional nuclear power plant it was set up to be kind of a smaller one and it was really That's to right. promote nuclear in the nuclear energy and show people how great and easy nuclear energy is <laughs> and then it couldn't have, they could they couldn't build one to a small one to make it work so they scrapped it so then they went on to big well, ones i guess right well like you said you know it's a completely failed experiment on every level and Every single level, it's failed. Well, you know, they tried and tried yeah. and tried to make it, you know, work for them because they believe in it, you know. And really, that's just bullshit, too, because we all know that nukes are for war. We've just changed the messaging, and the messaging is nukes supply cheap, clean energy for your house. That's the message, you know. It's just a message. It's not real, what yes. real is nukes are for. That's what's real. But yeah. find somebody, a Joe Schmo on the street, who um, you know lives in Washington, and they'll tell you that, or anywhere, anywhere, and they'll tell you that. Well, yeah, you know, I think we do need nukes because it's cheap energy. It's the messaging. It's clean. It's clean and green. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't produce any harm. Well, it's like that lady that we talked about earlier in the show, that woman who was looking into microencephaly. John Goffman right. and Arthur Tamplin did unequivocal scientific data. We don't need to rehash scientific data over and over again when it has been proven that it causes microencephaly, period. That's what it causes. And But for right. a woman who's in the health department to not even been even informed she has she didn't I mean, even know we had a nuke plant right right exactly and that's an intent it's kind of like me though Mimi I mean I'm, I'm guilty of that myself I grew up next to San Onofre my entire life I thought it was an observatory for the military <laughs> do you know what I mean I mean I, I well it's the messaging exa mission accomplished I guess that's what mission it's accomplished meant, really meant yeah the me it's meant to work. There's a reason that nuclear energy has the most amount of money going into it from our government as part from the war machine. Yes. You know, they have so much money so much jumped money. into it. And That's right. It's yeah. Isn't it, isn't it something like more than 90% of our energy budget goes into nuclear? I don't know. It's what some, I do know is Hanford alone. It's 80, 90 percent of our Department of Energy budget goes into the nuclear program, and that is really strictly to support the nuclear weapons supply. And now we have moved into this. I mean, we are Machiavellian in the worst way in this country now. We have actually moved into a time where depleted uranium weapons are standard practice now for the United States government since the uh, military rewrote their uh, code and said, while the rest of the world believes depleted uranium is a bad thing, the United States sees it as a necessary element. And so now we're using right. depleted uranium and selling them. We're not just us using them. We're selling depleted uranium weapons all around the world now. It's... it's yeah beyond unconscionable and for people to not call up I mean I do call up my congressman and my senator and tell them I really believe we need to defund the military it's just such an outrage that we are destroying our country and creating war that's what our country does you know it's a it's an unconscionable act I, I, I honestly I'm it motivates me to get up and you know like think and complain and look yesterday I posted on YouTube I called up about the um, election fraud cases I mean I'm I, I have to say as an American I'm kind of heartbroken to realize that we really live in the United Soviet States of America we have one party called the Republicrats and nothing that we say or do is going to change 
the trajectory of what they're going to, unless we get millions of people in the street. Like in China, they shut down. China was going to build a nuclear power plant in one of their biggest provinces, and millions and millions of people came to the street, and the government said, okay, we're not going to build it. In communist China, where they throw people in jail for talking against the government, they got millions of people in the streets to stop a nuclear power plant, and it worked. So it could work here if people would give a damn. You know, if people don't, even, people don't even understand. People don't even know nuclear exists here. They don't even know what it is. So to get them from a place of not knowing what nuclear is to getting them in the streets to then thinking that that's going to make a difference, that anyone in government is going to care, is a really long road. And I think just looking at climate chaos, we don't have that road. It doesn't exist anymore. Well, you know, know that climate so chaos, think- this is one of my things, Mimi, I don't know if you agree with me, but I think climate change is an acronym for nuclear pollution, because I don't care what 350.org wants to say. In my view, nuclear pollution is what has driven climate, the quote, climate change over the air. We now have a blob in the ocean. They call it a blob. It's nuclear pollution from Fukushima that we knew was coming three years ago. They said we were going to get this nuclear pollution it sort of hung together, and it's going to hit the West Coast. So they're calling it a blob. They keep changing the terms, and yet mm-hmm. at, we talk about can. Now we're having all these new cancer relief, and we're going to have cancer studies, and we have all this... All this money being poured into cancer research. We talk about cancer, but not why are we getting cancer? We're getting cancer because of nuclear pollution. We're getting cancer because we have destroyed our environment. And it's time to stop this system of destruction. I, I, I agree. I agree. I do agree with you. I, I apologize. I'm not really see. interviewing you. I'm sort of like, I can't, I'm like, That's I can't okay. believe you told me about this power plant up there. They just threw it in the river. The implications mm-hmm. of that he, are He told huge. me where. He, yeah, he told me where. So have, have there been any, what would happen if a diver went in the river down there to look? Would they get, would they get sick going near it? Are the animals sick? Has anybody looked near there? What happens when they well, do this I, stuff? I, I imagine that, well, first of all, it heats the river up. Um, and what would need to be done is testing of water, which is a difficult test. And there are very few labs who do that. Wow. It's really expensive. And then you know, the question is, is you know, um, he, he told me haven't seen it. I think the first move would be to something to well, I think we're missing you. We missed most of what you said. Are you there? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can, but guess Hello? what? We are coming up into our last 45 seconds of the show, Mimi. I want to thank you for this conversation, and thank you for spilling the beans about what's gone up there in Trojan, although there's nothing we can do about it again. I mean, they're all in complete denial, but at least we know to stay away from there. Stay out of the Columbia yeah. River, that's for sure. Don't that's go right. swimming in the Columbia River. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> so Mimi German, thank you for joining us here on uh, this Wednesday and uh, thank you for all the work you do with Radcast.org and No Nukes Northwest and uh, man I hope to have you back on again soon sometime in September so we can uh, have this conversation again okay thanks Lonnie thank you so much put your courage feet on you guys take action any action that you feel is important take care we'll talk to you soon 